Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Randy Perryman. I'm with Dell and part of the Revolutionary Cloud and Big Data Group. I am the primary author of our Dell Red Hat OpenStack reference architecture. Um, as part of the reference architecture, we've included Ceph as our primary um, block storage, and we've been adding it in as object store to that. And over the, when we first began doing this, we knew we wanted that, and we asked our storage team for someone to give us a hand, and they sent us Steve. <laughs> Hi, my name's Steve Hand. I'm working the storage team at Dell and Ceph, and what we're going to be talking about today, hopefully, is useful to you all. How many of you guys actually use Ceph? Could you show? How right, you guys are using it? How much? How many people are interested in not using it? All right. Well. Okay, well, so I have hopefully some insight for those that don't use it or haven't put in production yet. But, but actually, the other thing I wanted to do is get into how the two interact with each other and how you actually set it up and some of the insights that we've seen since we uh, set it up. So the first thing I wanted to do for those that don't know what it is and is point out a couple things. First of all, it says it's an object storage system. It is an object storage system, but the objects that you see are not quite the same as what you'd see in an object storage system itself. That is um, something like S3 or Swift. It's a different object. Unfortunately, they're both called objects. So that's why I want to point out that they are different. But the interesting part about the Ceph objects is they're actually striped across the disks. And that's interesting and important to know when you're actually administering it. And of course, and I think we've heard many times at this conference already that you can scale to very large sizes with Ceph. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out that's interesting for storage is that Ceph is set up to be hardware storage hardware ag agnostic. And that's important if you want to optimize Ceph, which is one thing that the RA has done, is we've tried to take this best servers we have and direct them to particular use cases within Ceph and pick the right hardware that makes uh, Ceph work best in the OpenStack case. So just for, you guys already know this, I think, mostly, but I put this on the slide just in case those didn't know what the terms were, and I use them later. Uh, first of all, there's this thing called an object storage daemon, which is basically a Linux daemon that it serves up a disk worth of data, what it boils down to. There's another thing called a monitor. Now, the interesting thing about Ceph is that, uh, unlike a lot of storage technologies, the clients know where the data is. And this is important for scaling. It's what allows it to scale to large sizes is when the clients actually know where to get it from. So that way, parts of your, your cluster can be down or inaccessible, and you still know how to get to the rest of it. And then clients, when I say clients here, I'm talking about really the kind of like the iSCSI moral equivalent of an iSCSI initiator. That's a client in Ceph, and it talks the radius protocol. So uh, the storage applications, in this case, for OpenStack, Cinder, Nova, Glance, and KVM are users of that client. So of course, Ceph provides block storage and object storage to OpenStack and uh, I guess at some point, CephFS. <coughs> There's two types of storage for block. One is volumes, which I'd call permanent storage, where you put your data and you want it to live forever, but also ephemeral storage, where you uh, maybe put the operating system for one of your instances and then expect it to go away. And we'll get into that in a little bit on how you tell the difference with it from Ceph itself. Uh, all this activity is user space uh, access. And, and that's important, I think. Uh, well, it's important for a couple reasons. One is uh, the, um, the operating system doesn't really know where that this Ceph activity is going on. And that's important if you want to move VMs from, uh, from rack to rack and not have to reconfigure the host you're running them on in order to get access to the storage. Uh, obviously, I said already that there's a, um, a service implementation in Ceph, which we'll get to in a little bit, called the uh, Radius Gateway. It supports the Swift and S3 protocols. And another thing that makes an OpenStack interesting versus a lot of other technologies is that <coughs> compute and storage are separated. So that way, uh, storage can grow differently than um, compute. And, I don't know anybody ever throws any data away, so you know it's going to grow and grow and grow, of course. 
So in the particular RA that uh, Randy mentioned, we have uh, some separation of networks. And this is a simplification of what we have. Uh, we have one admin node, which we run um, the open form and installer on. We uh, run uh, an administration node for Ceph and the, um, the administration GUI. We also have three controllers and, and three compute nodes and three storage nodes as like the base configuration. And the way we have it set up, there's a provision network that you can actually blast the operating system down in its configuration. Uh, that's internally visible from the administration node, and all the nodes are on that network. There's also a public net that allows clients from the outside to get in, you know, your users of Horizon, for example, and also a private network where you want to hide from everybody. And we use VLANs to separate all that. So as I said, there's a, the open form in, uh, as a, in a VM. There's also Ceph in a VM. We have this Calmari client, which is used mostly for monitoring. You know, you want to know how your nodes are doing, whether you're using up all the memory and so on. And a bunch of Ceph CLIs, including the Ceph deploy installer. <clears throat> and then the rest of the stuff I think you're probably already familiar with. OK, so the first thing I think you want to know before you set up your, your Ceph cluster is, this a little squeaky, is what your workload is going to look like. Right? And this is a hard thing for many customers to actually know what it's actually going to look like. Because sometimes they're in transition from other technologies, and they're putting various type of workload from somewhere else into OpenStack. And they kind of really don't know. But if you knew what your workload was, you could do things like optimize hardware for a particular workload. Like one important difference is do you have a sequential workload or do you have a random workload? And this makes a difference in whether you use SSDs or not, or what type of hard drives you select, and that sort of thing. Or, as we did at least for uh, our current version of the RA, you pick a, a configuration that will probably work for everything, at least for a time. Now, with some techniques I'll, I'll cover later, you can migrate away from that over time as you start to figure out what your workload really is and then uh, move to hardware that's perhaps more uh, adapt or more in line with what that workload is. Okay, and one guideline that was very interesting that our, our brother at Red Hat gave us is um, <clears throat> when you're setting up a Ceph cluster, when you go into production, one node should be one-tenth of the capacity or less. And that's important so that your recovery actually finishes. Uh, that's an important thing. Uh, but it's OK, of course, for POCs to have a small configuration. And the other thing that we do as a best practice is, uh, at least as far as the Ceph clients and the OSDs, is that the Ceph clients talk to Ceph and, um, and the monitors on one network, and the OSDs talk to um, to each other for replication on a different network. Uh, yes, sir. Just for understanding, you just said uh, is the capacity of the node should constitute less than one tenth of the total personal capacity load. Yes. Did I not say that? The slide says otherwise. Uh, the slide says that. Oh, my apologies. <laughs> less than. Thank you. I'll change that a little bit before I post it. All right. It's a good catch, thank you. Someone was listening. OK. OK, so designing for redundancy. Now, and uh, with our, our configuration, we have data path redundancy in a lot of different places. But having talked to customers at scale, very large, sometimes they say, well, you know, if I have 10 racks of worth of equipment, do I really need more than one switch in a rack? Do I need more than one power supply for each node? Maybe I can save a little money by, as I get this big, I can lose a whole rack and be OK. So uh, just some thoughts there. You know, if, you, if you're really designing in that way, you, you know, I don't know if you guys are getting clusters that big. But that's certainly within the realm of what's possible. You can save uh, setup costs by reducing the number of redundant hardware. Uh, and the other thing that's uh, kind of a hidden gotcha here is that uh, there's this thing called a placement group, which I didn't mention. Placement group is kind of an algorithm, really. It, it, it's, it describes how the data will be replicated, whether it's an erasure code or it's uh, just a straight replication, what pool will be put in, and that sort of thing. And there's limits to how many you can have on each disk or each OSD. 
So when you're calculating, you know, you're figuring this out in the beginning, and you're working through how many pools you want, you have to figure out, well, if I have this many pools and this many placement groups per pool, how many total replacements groups do I have? And I think, at least in the previous version of Ceph, there was a warning you'd get if you had too many. I think they were talking about changing that, but that's something you have to consider. Now, there's a couple ways you go about it. The easiest one is you install Ceph first, of course. Alternatively, you can install Ceph later. You install OpenStack first, then Ceph, which is what we're doing. And uh, actually, it's not as funky as it sounds. You know, when you install Ceph first, it generates its FSID. You can generate the, the, uh, all the keys, and you can generate multi-users and groups and so on, uh, and then add them, or not groups, but just users. Or you can generate those without the cluster existing yet, and then install Ceph later. Uh, and kind of in line with where we're going is that we'll, we'll install OpenStack, set up Ceph, install the clients, and then install the servers. So both are possible. So I'm going through an outline here. And for those guys that have already used this, this is kind of the general high-level outline of installing Ceph. And this is, of course, using Ceph Deploy, right? So first thing is you want to install Ceph. The, um, install the operating system all over the place. Uh, you know, all your three different types of nodes for Ceph, which is storage, the monitor, and the gateway. For us, the monitor and the gateway are on the OpenStack controllers, but they don't need to be. And then the client nodes, which are your compute nodes in our case, but they could be other nodes as well. And then you uh, <coughs> set up your SSH keys, create the configuration file, modify the configuration file, you know, like, like the placement groups I mentioned previously. And then um, you deploy all the Ceph packages. And let's see. Generate the keys, pretty much, and then install the gateway at the end. All right, one thing I want to point out is that uh, Ceph has this one configuration file called ceph.conf. And it, you put all your configuration in this one file. You configure the OSDs, you configure the monitors, you put defaults for the cluster, you configure, it, configure the gateway, and so on, right? Now, one way is you could put this in the various type of nodes and then modify that mo file to customize, let's say, on the gateway node, you customize the gateway over there. And, and then on the OSD, you customize the OSDs in this one file. The trouble is that um, now you have multiple versions of the same file that if you ever happen to copy it from another server, you've overwritten your configuration. So my recommendation to you guys is have one copy of the file. You put it all in that one file, and then you don't have that problem. OK, now, integration with uh, Ceph with OpenStack, well, so first of all, Ceph doesn't have any understanding it's being used by OpenStack, right? So what you're doing, basically, is you're, you're telling Cinder what volume you're going to use, what keys, what user and ID password it's actually going to use when it logs in, and, uh, and there's some other parameters there. And the same with the backup. So what we're doing, and what would be a good suggestion for you guys, is have different pools for those different applications. And the reason why that's important is that the, I'll get to in a little while. Actually, it's on another slide. And the same thing with glance. You have a glance pool. You have a, uh, you know, a volumes pool or whatever you want to call it for, uh, for sender. And then you have one for backup. Now, incidentally, KVM doesn't really know it's being used by OpenStack either. So it has its own write system. So one of the things you have to do is you have to tell KVM, <coughs> this is the user you use to go talk to Ceph. Incidentally, it's an XML file. And in this XML file, there is a Boolean. And the Boolean tells the KVM to actually create a, a ephemeral volume. Okay. And I'll get to what that looks like in a little bit. You guys can stop me if any time you have questions. All right. So racing through this, uh, I thought I'd put some kind of what it looks like slides so that you could see the comparison for those that don't, don't, haven't seen this already. Now, most of you have, so forgive me. I didn't know that. So the first thing is hopefully you can see a list of cinder volumes. 
And the second one is using this uh, client on a different server, in this case our administration server, you can see um, a list of volumes as well. And the, how you match them is that it just so happens that Cinder creates a volume in Ceph with the name of volume hyphen and a, this UUID, which happens to match the one in the previous list. So that's how you can match the two. And it's pretty easy to take a look at both. I show this because when you, you, when you administer Ceph, you make changes, or you move things around, you're going to want to know what machines this affects. And you can go backwards up the stack to figure out what uh, instances that are related to those volumes. Glance images are a little easier. It turns out the name of the uh, Glance volume and the name that it appears in Ceph are identical. So that's easy. Now. One cool thing is you might want to know what, what OSD a particular image is on or a particular object is on in case, let's say, that disk fails. And this is a slide that shows you how to do that. Now, uh, in this case, there are, for block, there are three copies of, those, of all the objects, okay, all the block devices. So uh, what you see above is a volume from the previous list with some details. And the second one is the command you actually use to figure out where that is. So uh, a little bit of translation. The three numbers and commas are the OSD numbers, with the primary being OSD 28. And the bottom lists, I've cut out those three OSDs so you can actually see uh, what machines those are on. Now, if you had set up your pools uh, so that they had racks and data centers, uh, you would actually, be, these uh, Ceph would split them across racks as well. So these wouldn't be just three different machines, they'd also be three different racks. Okay? It's a handy thing. So ephemeral volumes, I thought I'd mention this because the KVM creates an ephemeral volume when you, when you set that Boolean that I mentioned previously, but you don't actually see it from sender. So here's a list of, uh, let's see, I don't know how many disks there are, but seven, I think, maybe. And then the last one is one of the sender volumes from the previous slide, I think. And then, as you can see, sender doesn't know about the ephemeral volumes. So they, uh, the difference is that there is a UUID here, but it has a prefix of underscore disk, and that's your ephemeral disk. One thing is that, you know, I first started getting involved in this, I had trouble kind of grokking what HA was. After a while, I kind of figured it out that there are really two different types of HA. Really one type and then a subset. So one type of HA is service availability. If one of your instances of your service, let's say Horizon or Cinder, fails, another copy takes over. But there's also data availability too. So the combination of OpenStack high availability and um, Ceph high availability means that you can basically lose any node, which is really what you want to go to. You want to be in a situation where any, you can lose any node and you still can, you still can process requests. Um. Randy? You're doing such a good job. So in addition to the high availability, we made sure that our networking is highly available. So every node is set up with two independent NICs of 10 gig going to two independent switches. So it, any one item fails. I'm sure almost every one of you have seen this type of network before. The switches are connected with a VLT, meaning they do MAC address sharing which allows us to do LACP bonds, taking full advantage of both 10 gig NICs. Okay. So, um, one little thing, I'm, I, I'm going to mention this a little bit, what an object storage system is. Uh, it's, a, it's a little different than uh, the objects we talked about previously. And generally, if you boil down an object storage system, it's really a web server. And a web server in which you do a post, and there's some binary stuff in the body, and that's your object. Uh, and you know, there's a couple of protocols involved in the OpenStack implementations. One's Swift, one's S3. And really, if you looked at them, the only difference is what headers they use. If you were actually look at them in the, uh, uh, some wire tracing protocol software. 
Um, now, the interesting part about object storage for me, I mean, some people use objects for object storage for writing images. And you know, that doesn't make me very excited to do that sort of thing, because it probably doesn't add any value. For me, the, the value added with an object storage system is that the client can write data, files and things. And you can modify those files with metadata. And, and that's where you get your real power in an object storage system, is you use that instead of a file system. There's a lot of benefits for doing that. But one thing I should mention <coughs> that's relevant here is that when you, when you have an object storage system, you're expecting a sequential I.O. And that's generally a different type of server than one that's random I.O. Uh, and then it's, you know, for your, uh, your block servers, you're expecting at least uh, you know, small block random I.O. Even if all the, v the VMs were to write sequentially, it would work out the small block I.O. anyway or at least random I.O. But for object storage, you would expect it all be sequential I.O. So there, as I mentioned previously, there is a uh, object storage gateway implementation in the Ceph uh, project called the Radius Gateway. And today, it's changing, but today it's a CGI implementation based on HTTPD. And it's stateless. There's really no information. The gateway itself retains all the information it gets is from the underlying um, underlying Ceph. It's at the you know it also uses the Ceph client as well. But if you want to make it high availability, if you want to make it um, scale, you just use HA proxy. And if you want to make it high available, you can use things like Pacemaker to make sure the service process itself is up. So the, here's an overview of the installation for those. How many people have actually installed Radius Gateway? How many people use it in production? All right, well there. OK, there you go. So uh, generally, um, this is a good way. I mean, this is a good opportunity to use erasure encoding. And I'll show you what the difference is uh, as far as capacity usage. Uh, erasure encoding is a neat way to get very good redundancy with a very little overhead. So um, currently, it's not adv advisable to use erasure encoding with block storage. But with uh, object storage, it's a great fit. So the first thing is you create these uh, RGW pools. You have to create them in advance before you install the gateway, because you want to make sure it's erasure encoded. You install the gateway in the supporting packages. You configure the RGW instances in the ceph.comp. You configure each server. Uh, you may have to tweak HTTPD uh, uh, to handle, let's say, more threads than it usually does. Uh, you create a CGI definition for it, a website really for HTTP. Um, you start up the RGW process, you restart your HTTP services, and you're good to go. It's rel relatively easy. Now, what I wanted to point out here, this is a list of all the pools for OpenStack and all the gateway pools. And the gateway ones have the dot in front of them. I'm not sure why they have the dot convention, but that's it. So this happens to be in a system that has three storage nodes, 13 drives per, per storage node. Three we're reserving for the SSDs. That's why the odd number. But you can see here, you know, um, Ceph is uh, it's thin provision all the way. Okay, even the RAID sets or even the even the stripes aren't laid down yet. So all the pools except for one have the same size. And it's really because um, a little bit of capacity has been used, but you know, any way these pools can grow into the, into the remaining capacity. That's why they're all the same size, except for the one in red, which appears dark in the middle. And that's an erasure encoded pool. So the rest of them have 48, 48 terabytes left, while the erasure encoding has uh, 96 terabytes. So rather than a 3x overhead, you have a 1.4 overhead, in this case with k equals 4 and m equals 2. So really powerful stuff to be able to put your, most of your data in an erasure encoded pool. So I wanted to show you what, what this looks like. So let's say you wanted to play with one of these. The easiest way to play with one of these is there's a client inside of OpenStack called uh, you know, uh, Python Swift. It's easily installed here. I have some instructions at the top on how to do it. And, and, and the two commands in the middle, they basically point to a directory and upload a bunch of files. All right, the one command in the middle and the second one actually lists out these files. These happens to be sample images from Windows. 
uh, you know, copyright Microsoft, I think. But in any case, you can see how easy it is to copy up a bunch of files and put them in your object storage system. Now, there isn't really, I couldn't find a uh, S3 client, command line client. So um, this is actually a Python a uh, application uh, or library set called Bodo. And uh, what I'm just showing here is in Python using uh, the interpreter. You connect to the server. That's what all this stuff here at the top is. You connect to your one of your gateways, or actually, or your HA proxy if you're using that. Uh, you create a bucket for your photos. Uh, you and then you just uh, yes. Use S3 ah, okay. Well, there you go. There's one of them. I could, thank you. Anyway, and you load up a bunch of uh, of these files, and there you go. You have a bunch of files into into the gateway, and it's actually really easy to do this. So you can do this right from the clients. All right, this is really fast. You guys have any questions? Yes, sir. So my question is um, on the presentation. There was a screenshot of uh, Glenn's command line, and so you you put an image in Glenn's thanks to uh, Ceph, and uh, this was a QCO2 image, and I heard that there was problems by starting instances with KVM under QCO2, and that has to be. Um, I would say replaced by a, a raw image. How does it work? Ah, uh, I think that has to do with cloning. So if you want to actually clone the image using Ceph, it, it doesn't know how to do the difference with that image type. So that's when you have need to use the raw image because it manages the uh, uh, copy and write. Any other questions? Um, well, go ahead. Say your question. I'll repeat it. Did everybody hear the question? Anybody not hear the question? OK. Um, that's probably a good rule of thumb. Yeah, you could probably do that. Well, one way is you could do as you said, but keep in mind that as your cluster grows, the pools you create are going to use the whole thing. So at a certain point, if you get too many um, drives, when you're striping all your data across to all these drives, you'll start to run in the overhead of just making all the copies. So uh, at a certain point, you might want to limit how big a pool gets so it's not over your entire cluster. So that consideration will complicate the formula a little bit. It is, but you do need to consider how many total you have. Yes, right. So it's just a consideration there is really my point. Um, any other questions? Please. Uh, we've been told by our Red Hat colleagues that it's not quite ready. And uh, there were some issues, I think, with metadata. You know, I saw in the, um, you know, the um, activity in, in the Ceph dev. So they were working that out at the time. I don't know if they have worked it. I assume they have. I think it's ready for this particular release. So if you have Giant or, or sorry, the latest release, you should be good. But at the Firefly time, it wasn't ready. Hmm. 
Well, I think, you know, it depends on the caching technology, but at least if you created a pool in the cache tiering and you lose part of that pool, you still have the redundancy mechanism. If you lose a node and you have this cache tier split across multiple nodes, you're still in business. You know, so that, that's a plus, depending on what you're using uh, for your alternative. Some may have similar redundancy, but that's, that's one benefit of using cache tiering, at least how it's architected. Is you still have that same redundancy, that pool, that cache tier pool still behaves from a redundancy standpoint like you know another pool. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, well, um, you know, at a small scale, probably not. At a large scale, yes, because as you know, in Ethernet, everybody listens to the traffic on the same network. So the clients would hear all this traffic and they would wait and, uh, for that traffic to complete before, you know, uh, responding or doing their work. So separating the two, then you can have the two operations occur without, yeah. And you, you, you know, the replication you want to occur, right? So. You don't want the two not talking because they're on the same network. Is that a question? Does it? Well, I know it does. Okay. The, uh, the consensus view is it's around 10% uh, uh, extra overhead, 10 to 20% extra overhead, because it's a post-processing. So you do your write, and then it, then it encodes. But uh, uh, from both, but I think from production is, yeah. So in our RA, we have two processors per storage node just to have that extra headroom for both the erasure encoding but also for replication because replication uses a lot of processing too. When in reality, you probably only need one processor because uh, you know, most of your bottleneck and stuff is the drives anyway. It's not the, not the processor overhead. So if you have an extra processor, you're probably good. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, well, I think there is, well, we'll we talk afterwards in the actual algorithm, but there's a, there's a way to figure that out. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be, well, it depends how many drives you fail at once, but, you know, one would expect that you would probably be able to recover pretty quickly. But as you grow, of course, the, the likelihood of any drive failing in a large cluster, you're going to get drives failing all the time, right? Even though e the, re the uh, mean time to failure for any given drive is, is large, if you have enough po population, you're going to have drives failing daily, right? Um, any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, uh, there's a couple. Um, yes, there is. A, you know, there's a. Um, we have found at Dell, there's a wide variance on SSD performance. So you really want an SSD that gives at least 400 megabytes per second, right? So I'd give you about in a random I/O scenario a five to one ratio. Now, on the sequential pool, you don't want any SSDs. That's actually a negative. So that's why you have two pools, so you can split what hardware it's on, right? Ultimately, you know, when you start out, you don't need it because you have a balanced config, but as you grow, you might want to split them out. So five to one ratio. And then to your previous question, there's a couple parameters in this configuration file. One for how the XSF file system is created. 
There's some best practices around the parameters for that. And there's also some best practices on the mount parameters for that file system. We actually do have a separate team that is working that particular problem, so I'm, I'm not up to speed on the, the nuances. But certainly Intel's a good one. Uh, I think the Toshiba one's a good one, too. There are some that are problematic that I won't mention. But uh, in any case, uh, with those two, you're probably right. Any other questions? We're at the end of our time here. Thank you very much, guys. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.